The Nez Perce withdrew from Whitebird, and, when General Howard caught up with them, had crossed with all their equipment and pony herds to the relative safety of the south bank of the Salmon River. After a few skirmishes, the Nez Perce were joined by Looking Glass's band, whom the army attacked earlier. They crossed back to the north bank of the river, leaving the army behind. Chief Joseph sat in the councils, but since he had never been a war chief, his advice carried less weight than that of men like Five Wounds, Tehuhuzut, Looking Glass, and Rainbow. On the march and in battle, Joseph took charge of the old men, women, and children, an assignment of vital importance and sacred trust, while Olakot, his brother, and the already mentioned experienced war chiefs led the young men on guard duty and in combat. On July 11th, General Howard, pursuing the natives, suddenly sighted their camp lying below him on the opposite side of the Clearwater River. He opened fire with a four-inch howitzer and two Gatling guns and prepared to launch an attack. The Nez Perce were taken by surprise but regrouped and held the line. General Howard ordered the army to dig in. Several times, small groups of Nez Perce charged to engage the soldiers in hand-to-hand -hand fights. The fighting raged all day and continued in the same spot the next morning. The fighting lasted until noon when Chief Joseph managed to pack the families and got them safely away with the herds. The Nez Perce then withdrew suffering four deaths and six wounded. The army losses were 13 killed and 27 wounded. Looking Glass, who had hunted buffalo and fought with the crows in Montana, urged that they cross the mountains and join that tribe. They thought General Howard would leave them alone once they left Idaho, so his proposal was accepted. It was a painful and exhausting trip for both the pursuers and the pursued. In the meantime, word of the native flight had been telegraphed ahead to Montana, and from Missoula, Captain Charles C. Ron, with 35 men of the 7th Infantry and 200 citizen volunteers from the Bitterroot Valley, hastened to the eastern end of the Lolo Trail and threw up a log fort to block the hostiles' passage until General Howard could catch up to them from the rear. After nine days in the mountains, the Nez Perce appeared above Ron's fort, and Joseph, Looking Glass, and an elderly chief named Whitebird came down for a parley. Explaining that they were on their way to the Crows, the natives promised to move peacefully through the Bitterroot Valley, respecting the settlements and paying for any supplies they needed. This satisfied the volunteers, who, having no stomach for a fight with them, deserted Captain Ron and went back to their homes. The Nez Perce stopped for several days at Stevensville to rest up and trade stock with the settlers. Looking Glass patrolled the streets of Stevensville, making sure his young warriors weren't getting drunk and causing trouble. The friendly treatment they received from the Montana citizens made them believe that now that they were out of Idaho, the war was over and they were safe. They moved leisurely south to the Big Hole Valley and, on an open meadow beside the Big Hole River, set up camp to rest. General Howard was still far back in the Bitterroots, temporarily out of the picture. But unknown to the Nez Perce, a new force of 163 Army regulars and 35 volunteers under Colonel John Gibbon was hurrying cross-country from Fort Shaw on the Sun River by forced march to attack them. On the night of August 8th, Colonel Gibbon gained a wooded hill above the unsuspecting Nez Perce camp and the next morning at dawn launched a surprise attack. Firing volleys into the sleeping camp, the soldiers charged down the hill in a long line, forded the shallow river, and swept into the camp, shooting and clubbing men, women, and children. Colonel Gibbing's commanding officer on the left had been killed during the opening charge, and without a leader, that part of the line faltered as natives stood their ground and fought back desperately from their teepees. The troopers were forced toward the right, allowing the Nez Perce in that sector to get a firing line against them. 
This brought confusion to the main part of the camp, where Colonel Gibbon's men, in complete control, were unsuccessfully trying to set the leather teepees on fire. With his troops being pushed together, and soldiers being stuck both by the warriors on the left and by Whitebird snipers on the right, Colonel Gibbon, who had been wounded in the leg, ordered a withdrawal across the river to the protection of the wooded knoll from which the attack had been launched. The Nez Perce swarmed after him, and in a few moments he found himself on the defensive, fighting fiercely, his position encircled by well-concealed native sharpshooters. While the warriors held the army under encirclement, Chief Joseph once again gathered the families and herds and moved away south. By 11 that night, with their camp safely away, the warriors decided to break off the engagement. Backing off slowly to guard against pursuit, they took to the trail after Joseph. Joseph estimated that 80 Nez Perce were killed, 50 of them women and children. This battle marked a turning point. No more would Chief Joseph and his tribe believe that peace could be an option. Colonel Gibbon's men, cut up and dazed, were in no condition to follow. 33 soldiers were dead and 38 wounded. 14 of the 17 officers were casualties. General Howard's men, coming up the next day, found the troops still in a state of shock burying the dead and trying to care for the groaning wounded. As for the Nez Perce, they decided to seek refuge in Canada, like Sitting Bull before them. They headed east toward Targhee Pass, which would lead them over the Continental Divide to Yellowstone, where they could turn north to Canada. As General Howard was on their tail, in a night attack, 28 warriors infiltrated General Howard's camp and ran off the general's horses, General Howard came to a dead halt, forced to search the settlements for new horses. Meanwhile, the natives hurried and entered the Yellowstone National Park. They ran into several groups of tourists. Some of the young warriors, now utterly distrustful of all whites, apprehended and shot two of them, although Chief Joseph did what he could to protect the rest. Army troops of the 7th Cavalry under Colonel Samuel Sturgis were waiting for the Nez Perce to emerge from the park. But Joseph and his people crossed the Absorca Range in places deemed impassable and eluded their captors. Then they continued straight north for the Canadian border, their refuge of last resort. Sturgis gave chase with 300 men. At Canyon Creek, the bands turned north, and here, on September 13th, Colonel Sturgis' hard-riding cavalry overtook them. There was a furious fight, but at the end, the Nez Perce managed to escape. They counted three wounded, while the army lost three men and eleven remained wounded. The Nez Perce were becoming tired and dispirited, and they were losing horses. Beyond Canyon Creek, their old allies, the Crows, now in service as scouts for the army, began to attack them. The Nez Perce fought them off in running engagements and continued across the Muscle Shell to the Missouri River. About 40 miles short of the Canadian border, exhausted by the long flight, they paused to rest, confident that they had escaped all pursuers. But they were wrong. From Fort Keogh in the east, Colonel Nelson A. Miles, with nearly 600 men that included the 2nd and 7th Cavalry, the mounted 5th Infantry and a body of Cheyenne warriors was riding across Montana, hoping to intercept the hostiles before they crossed the border. On the cold, blustery morning of September 30th, Colonel Miles Cheyenne scouts sighted the Nez Perce teepees on the northern edge of the Bear Paw Mountains. Colonel Miles ordered an immediate attack. The Cheyenne and the 7th Cavalry, supported by the 5th Infantry, charged across the open ground toward the camp. One army group attacked the camp while the second scattered some of the tribe's horses. As the attack caught the Nez Perce by surprise, some were in camp and some were scattered around it. One group of 200 tribe members managed to escape to the north, fleeing to Canada. In the camp and around it, a bloody fight emerged, leaving two officers and 22 soldiers killed in the assault, 
and four officers and 38 enlisted men wounded. On the other side, many of the tribe's war leaders were killed. The heavy casualties Colonel Miles had sustained deterred him from ordering another charge, and he decided to lay siege to the camp. He made one attempt to cut off the natives from their water supply by establishing a line between the camp and the river. But the troops detailed to the task were driven back by fierce native resistance. The weather turned bitterly cold, and the next morning, five inches of snow covered the unretrieved bodies of the dead. The Nez Perce, wounded, hungry, and cold, suffered intensely. On October 4th, General Howard reached the battlefield with a small advance party that included two treaty-supporting Nez Perce. They were sent to negotiate with the band proposing an honorable surrender. Some of the chiefs opposed the surrender, but Chief Joseph decided to accept because of the people suffering. Chief Joseph mounted a horse and, followed by several men on foot, rode slowly up the hill from the camp and across to the army lines where General Howard and Colonel Miles awaited him. There he began his speech. Tell General Howard I know his heart. What he told me before, I have in my heart. I am tired of fighting. Our chiefs are killed. Looking Glass is dead. Tahul Huzut is dead. The old men are all dead. It is the young men who say yes or no. He who led the young men is dead. It is cold and we have no blankets. The little children are freezing to death. My people, some of them, have run away to the hills and have no blankets, no food. No one knows where they are, perhaps freezing to death. I want to have time to look for my children and see how many I can find. Maybe I shall find them among the dead. Hear me, my chiefs. I am tired. My heart is sick and sad. From where the sun now stands, I will fight no more forever. Colonel Miles promised to take them to the Lopue Reservation. Later, that promise was broken. At first, the Nez Perce were shipped by flatboats and boxcars to the Indian Territory in Oklahoma, where many of them got sick and died. But friendly whites and sympathetic societies in the East continued to work for them, and public sentiment finally forced approval of their return to the Northwest. In 1885, Chief Joseph and most of his band were sent to the Colville Reservation in Washington. Joseph made many attempts to be allowed to resettle in the Wallawa Valley, but each time he was declined. In 1904, he died, as his doctor said, from a broken heart. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the content, please consider supporting the channel by subscribing and becoming a Patreon.